All right, so you've seen this before, sort of. I've kind of mentioned it to you. The classical notions of gravity go back to Isaac Newton. Well, they kind of go back to Galileo. If you want to say they kind of go way back to the Greeks. Greeks didn't do a good job of gravity. Uh, the leading theory for the Greeks version of gravity was things want to be down, so they will go down. That was the theory of gravity 2,000 years ago. Uh, Galileo made some very important contributions to the ideas of gravity. And Newton sort of solidified all of it. So uh, Newton really gets the credit, although Galileo definitely pulled his weight when it came to understanding stuff. Um, I mean, but Newton did some really impressive things with gravity. And we take this for granted now, but the full name of the gravitational law is Newton's, uh, well, what is it called? Newton's law of universal, uh, Newton's law of universal mutual gravitation. I can't remember now. Anyway, there's words in there. And uh, the word universal is a big deal. And this is something that Isaac Newton was able to, uh, to enlighten humanity on. The laws of gravity as they apply on the earth are the same as they apply in space. And that may seem like an idea that's just like, duh, today, but back then it was not, duh. Um, it's a very powerful notion that, and it's actually something we incorporate in astronomy today, it's called universality. And it's the idea that the laws of physics, as they work in the room that you are in right now, listening to the Zoom lecture, are the same laws, the same physical constants, as uh, any other location in the universe. And that's a very powerful statement, and it's part of something called the cosmological principle. Uh, but it's very fundamental to understanding not just the law of gravity, but physics in general, because it's not something that we knew, that, that laws are universal. Uh, it's also called mutual gravitation. Yeah, the universal law of mutual gravitation. Got it, that's it. Universal law of mutual gravitation. Uh, the mutual is Newton's third law. So if you have two objects of mass, and in this example, I have M1, M2, uh, there is a gravitational attraction that will be exhibited between them. Uh, it's given as an inverse square law. It has a constant, proportionality constant, which is given by capital letter G, which is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Newton's meters squared over kilograms squared. That 10 to the minus 11 is pretty small. And what that indicates for us is that gravity is actually uh, very weak. Very weak. It's, it's um, something like 33, I believe, 33 orders of magnitude weaker than uh, electromagnetism. Now, gravity certainly appears to be stronger simply because there's a lot of mass in things. Earth has a lot of mass, sun has a lot of mass. <coughs> so we definitely get the impression that gravity is strong, but it's not strong. I mean, if you consider, you know, a couple bar magnets, right? What's the gravitational attraction between a couple bar magnets? I mean, you couldn't even measure it, right? Um, but obviously the electromagnetic interaction is very powerful on those things, so... Now, this is the traditional theory of gravity, and this is how we're going to handle it. Um, the modern theory of gravity is called general relativity, and it, it's very different. It doesn't have an equation like this, and if your goal at some point is to take physics to 11, we get into special relativity, and we just touch on the notions of general relativity. And then we think now even that all that is probably wrong, because we have this notion of dark matter that we can't figure out. And uh, again, you should take me for physics if you want to learn more about dark matter. I mean, for astronomy, if you want to learn more about dark matter. But uh, the growing consensus, not growing, I wouldn't use the word consensus, but there's a growing notion that our current ideas of gravity are incorrect. And that's why dark matter appears to be uh, uh, a, a thing, a phenomenon. It's because uh, it's not missing mass, it's actually incorrect uh, laws of gravity. So one thing about gravity that's really strange is that, and it's not like the other forces, is this, is that gravity is attractive, purely. We've never experienced a repulsive gravitational force, which is odd because electromagnetism has 
attraction and repulsion. And um, so, that, but nuclear forces appear to have a type of attraction and repulsion, but in a really strange sense, uh, nuclear forces tend to get stronger as you move further apart, which is really weird, but actually, okay, I, I should stop ranting and just move on here. Again, I told you I'm gonna have to try to control myself because I like this stuff a lot. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one comment about the uh, law here, the value for R. It's the distance between the objects and that distance is taken from the center of the objects. A lot of students uh, decide that the value for R is the distance between surfaces. It is not. It is the distance from the centers of the objects. Okay, just to be clear about that. Well, I already said it's an inverse square law. Uh, that means a lot of things. Two things I will say about it. Gravity is very sensitive to distance because of the squared factor. It's sensitive to mass as well, but not as much as distance. This just plays a much more important factor. Now, the fact that it's an inverse square law means a lot of things. And when you take physics 120, if you take it with me, um, I delve a little bit more into what it means to have an inverse square law. And what that ultimately means, it's a force that's applied in a three-dimensional space. Any force applied in a three-dimensional space will inherently have an inverse square law nature to it. It's something that comes out of, of what's called Gauss's law. And it's something we're going to do in physics 120. Um, but, you know, the gravitational force is attractive and it reaches out in all directions. And that's what gives rise ultimately to the square factor. Um, that R squared ultimately comes from an area formula. Okay, that's, that's what's going on there. I'll say more about that later. All right. <clears throat> so, got some... Uh, Questions here. I got I think I have three questions before we actually get into uh, examples of things. So again, you don't have to worry about chiming in on the chat here. I'm just gonna <coughs> go through this stuff. Uh, the force of planet Y on planet X is blank the magnitude of X on Y. Okay, so we have the force X on Y. We have planet X over on the left there. It is double the mass. Right? It's double the mass. So we want to know what the force is going to be from the other planet. All right, think about this for a minute. The question, the answer is C. Newton's third law says that the forces must be the same. It doesn't matter if planet X has double the mass. That's already accounted for when we've worked out what the force is. So F of X on Y is equal to F of Y on X in magnitude. All right, so that's an important aspect of Gravity, and that's one thing that we took for, kind of took for granted of in earlier stuff. I mean, we knew that Newton's third law was a thing, but we didn't typically look at both forces. I mean, there were some problems we did, but this is going to be a lot more important when we study these, this stuff here. <clears throat> okay, the gravitational force between two asteroids is apparently a million newtons. What will the force be if the distance between the asteroids is doubled? This is a great question. It's a conceptual question, really to get you to think about the nature of the inverse square law. All right, answer is A. A. So you're doubling the distance between the asteroids, which means you move them farther apart by a factor of two. Well, the inverse square law would require you to square that number two to four. And so we see that gravity is gonna be weaker by a factor of four, okay? Three stars are aligned in a row. The net force on the star of mass 2m is what? All right. So what you're doing here is you're considering a tug of war. Uh, mass 2 is being pulled to the right by m. It's being pulled to the left by 5m. Now, you'd look at 5m and say, well, that's bigger. That should be pulling more. True. Uh, if mass was the only thing we considered. But we have small m on the right here. And uh, small m is closer. So we need to figure out what that's going to be. So if we consider the interaction between 2m and m, the distance that's down there, it, it, we'll call it 2. Okay, those two dashes, we'll say it's a distance of 2. Well, if we're going to maintain the same ratio of mass to distance squared, that means uh, if you put an object out at twice the distance, so that means 
And I'm, before we answer this question, I'm going to highlight something here. Okay, so twice the distance is where 5m is located, right? Okay, so the ratio is m to r squared, okay? If we have twice the distance, the force should be weaker by a factor of 4. So that means this mass should be 4m because the force cancel out and you'll get the exact same interaction. This is more than that. So that means the net force is going to be to the left here, which is A. And these are the relative ratios here. Because the mass is a little bit higher than 4, because at 4, things are perfectly balanced. Okay, The left-hand side would be a 4 16th. And that simplifies, obviously, to 1 4th. But having the 5m there means it's a little bit bigger. And again, what you're trying to do is you're, you're making a ratio here. m to r squared. Okay, You can see the distances down there, so we know what kind of mass ought to be here. If it's exactly 4, then the answer is 0. If it's less than 4, that means the little m is doing more pulling. And if it's greater than 4, it's being pulled to the left. Okay. Hope you like that question. When you take Physics 120, I got a lot of those, quite a bit, and they're fun. Okay, determine the orbital period of the moon. <clears throat> so the force that keeps the moon in orbit is gravity. Gravity is uh, going to be uh, a centripetal force. So we simply say gravity equals ma but A is due to centripetal acceleration. So uh, M sub M is the mass of the moon. R would be the radius of the orbit, and omega is going to be uh, the angular speed, which can be turned into uh, the period. So I have the period here. Omega is 2 pi over T. You might remember that from all the circular motion stuff that we did. But uh, uh, we put that into the equation. So for FG, we put in... Don't put mg. Now we don't do mg anymore. Now we're doing uh, capital G, mm over r squared. The mass of the moon drops out. Uh, it does just so happens that the thing on the left there should would basically be the value for g, but not at the surface of the earth. It'd be out where the moon is, which is extraordinarily small, actually. <clears throat> so I substitute uh, in for omega the 2 pi over t. I solve for t. By the way, what you're looking at there is called Kepler's third law. Um, that's ultimately what it is, just equating uh, gravity with circular motion. We solve for T. And, you know, in this chapter, you're going to have to do a lot of number searching. Uh, you got to look up the mass of the moon. And you got to look up the distance to the moon on average. Uh, the mass of the moon's around... Oh, you don't need the mass. We need the mass of the Earth. It's about 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. I mean, I'm more precise here, 5.98. You want the distance to the moon. Now, the distance to the moon, uh, that already incorporates the center-to-center -center distances. So it's about 384,000 kilometers. You've got to put in meters, though. Anyway, uh, 27.4 days. 27.4 days. This is what we call the sidereal period of the moon. That's the true motion of the moon, how long it takes to orbit the Earth once. However, that is not the cycle of lunar phases. That's not the synodic period of the moon. That's not what we associate with the period for the moon. Okay, The period of, uh, of, of lunar cycle, um, like, the, um, like phases, follows 29.5 days, which is what the month is based on. Those are different, and if you want to know why... You should take for astronomy, because I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you. Take me for astronomy. Or you can look it up on your own. Good luck with that, though. Okay. Now, here's what's really weird about this stuff here. This is uh, actually an aspect of general relativity, uh, but I'm going to throw it in here. It's called the principle of equivalence, and it's one of the great mysteries of physics. So... In that example that I did, I had mass, and you couldn't tell, but I canceled out the mass of the moon. <laughs> you saw me do that. You saw me cancel out the mass of the moon. And it may seem obvious to, that you have to do that, but it's not. Let me go back to the example. So here's the, here's the kicker with the, uh, with the equivalence. 
This M right here, that is what's known as inertial mass. Okay, it shows up in Newton's second law. The M that occurs in the law of gravity is the gravitational mass. Now in this equation here, I canceled both of them out, which is strange because they happen to be equal, but we don't know why they're equal. The M that occurs in the gravitational force is the same M that occurs in Newton's second law. Those two things are not necessarily the same. They happen to be though. In all circumstances we've ever studied, inertial mass and gravitational mass are identical. And uh, we don't know why. It's a big mystery. If you figure it out, you should let me know um, because we can get a Nobel Prize. And there's a, a nice little monetary award that comes with that. You probably get your own Wikipedia page. That's pretty cool. So if you're all interested in that. All right. Moving on. All right. <clears throat> so um, as I mentioned, uh, we ultimately got little g from the force of gravity. So you, you've seen the gravitational force equation before when I, we introduced free fall motion. Uh, but the idea is that um, if you consider a single mass, okay, uh, that has a gravitational attraction on it, uh, we say that g m m over r squared is the gravitational force, and we set that equal to m a. Uh, the M's drop out, just like you saw in the last example, and then you see A is equal to the rest of it, the capital G, capital M, R squared. And this ultimately is what surface gravity is on any surface. If it's the Earth, you put in the value for Earth's radius and Earth's mass, but if it's any other surface, for example, some planet X, uh, you have to know what the planet's mass is, and you have to know what the radius is um, to do this. Um, and then you can figure out what the surface gravity is on this. Uh, there's other ways to do it, though. In fact, you'll see this in the very last lecture that we do. We work with pendulums. Now, we actually did a pendulum lab. I think it was the last lab that we did before we came, uh, before we decided to uh, close the campus. But one of the things you might remember is that the, uh, the period of a pendulum is dependent on two things. It's dependent on the value of g, and it's also dependent on the length of the pendulum. So you can use a pendulum if you, you know, if you just wake up one day and you got kidnapped by some aliens and you end up in some weird planet, you can take out a pendulum if you have one in your pocket for some reason and you can measure the surface gravity of uh, of the planet. I, I don't it's not that helpful if you get kidnapped by aliens, but you know, something to pass the time, I suppose. All right. So, in this relationship here, we say planet X is free fall acceleration of 8 meters per second squared at the surface. Planet Y is twice the mass and twice the radius. So what is the gravitational uh, acceleration going to be here? Let's think about this for a minute. Now you're going to use that previous equation that I have there. Um, if you're twice the mass, acceleration is twice as high. If you're twice the radius then uh, the gravitational acceleration should be four times weaker. So if you combine the two factors together, we should be down by a factor of two, which would be answer B. That's right. So uh, what you can do is you can literally do this, actually. I mean, what you can do is you, you can take, you know, little g is big G, right, m over r squared. Well, what you can do is you can literally replace the, the letters with, numbers, right? So if I do, you know, a 2 for m, and I do a 2 for r, right, we end up with, well, I, should, I gotta put my m in here, of course, so I double the mass and I double the radius, and if you simplify this, you get a 1 half that sits out front here now, and that, that automatically communicates. It's half the value of g. So if, uh, you know, for these conceptual things, I mean, if you can't do it in your head, and you can certainly do this with the numbers here. And after a few times, you'll get sort of used to it, and then you can do it in your head. So, all right, let's move on. All right, 
so uh, when we consider things in orbit, um, obviously we have a decrease in value of the gravitational constant. Now, the gravitational constant you see down here, 9.83, I don't know about this three here, honestly. That may be a little wrong. I can't remember, although I would be shocked if you ever really needed three sig figs for uh, these numbers here, but um, let me just see what the, is there like an official like NIST standard? Yeah, uh, so it's defined. It's defined, actually, 9.80665. I don't know what the hell is, I don't know what's going on down here. I'll change that later. Not 8.3. I don't know what, I don't, that 8.3 comes from somewhere. I don't remember, though. Yeah, I don't remember. Anyway, um, now, however, when we talk about things in orbit, though, we usually refer to their altitude, right, their height, which when you're trying to figure out like the value for G or something, you need to realize that it's taken from the center of the object. So if you look at my equation here, um, you see that I have an RE plus H. RE is the radius of the Earth. That always has to be added in there. And this is going to happen with a lot of problems that you do. You're going to be told this satellite is, you know, a thousand, you know, a hundred kilometers up. You know, what's the, what's the value of G up there? Well, you got to know. You put in a hundred, you're going to have... You're going to be puzzled because you put in 100, you're going to get an enormous value for G. And um, and so you got to make sure that you put in the height here. Now, this equation is going to be rearranged a little bit. They took the R squared out so they can actually express the gravitational constant purely in terms of the gravitational constant, the acceleration at the surface of the Earth. Then you put in your value for H. So uh, either one is fine. I don't like... That I, I don't like that. That's my opinion. I like this thing, and I don't like this thing. Okay, here's why. You already got enough equations, right? You got enough equations. You don't need more equations. What's better is you learn the few equations, and then you simply apply concepts, and you make your equations as you go, right? That's why in kinematics, we got three equations, and that's all you need. Now, if you ever look things up, Khan Academy, YouTube videos, you probably saw some other kinematic equations, and uh, you shouldn't use those. That's going to get you in trouble, okay, because you're not going to understand what you're doing if you use other equations. There's only three. There's really only two. I gave you a third one just to save you, save you on some of the algebraic steps, but don't make new equations. Stick to with the basics and uh, figure out new equations on your own. That's my advice to you. It's a good advice to you. All right, so you can see here how the gravitational uh, uh, constant changes, okay? Um, in the space shuttle, space shuttle is pretty low. Um, the uh, ISS is pretty low, actually. Yeah, I think the ISS is actually at the same altitude um, International Space Station Altitude, 254 miles up. What is that? That's like, uh, that's like 400 kilometers, right? Yeah, it's about four, 450 times 1.6. That's not times. That's times. 1.6. Yeah, it's about 400 so this says spatial is at 300,000. ISS is, uh, is four. Now, that's not, I mean, look, look at the gravitational acceleration. It's pretty much the same as it is on Earth. Not that different. It's, it's down by one meter per second squared. Uh, they do that for a lot of reasons. Um, if you go up too high, there's a lot of junk up there. And, and, uh, and you're going to run into things. So that's not good. They put them in low orbits, and what they do is they have fuel, and then every, like, couple days they have to kind of, like, do a little burst, a little engine burst to put them back because at this altitude, things, orbits decay pretty quickly. And so it's very clean up there because anything that's lost up there, like if it's a satellite or something, it's, it's going to fall to Earth pretty quickly within a matter of weeks or months. So the space shuttle and the ISS gets really, really low. So they can avoid uh, being hit with things. Um, 
but it does require you to like maintain a, a like a thrust uh, every couple days. You gotta put a little more energy into your orbit, which I'll get into the end of this. Communication satellites are really far up. You can see here, all right, 35,000, 36,000 kilometers up, and the gravitational acceleration is small. It exists there. There's a reason why we put satellites up that high, and uh, which may be my next example. I don't know. In one of my examples, I'll, I'll, I'll derive why this uh, distance exists here. Astronauts on the space station, ISS, are weightless because why? The answer here is they're in free fall, right? They're falling. I think I talked about this at some point, but when I jump off the roof of my house, I'm an astronaut. And the difference between me and them is that I will hit the ground and they miss the ground. They're so far up, they're moving so fast in the tangential direction that they fall like a person would fall if you fall out of the sky. But because of their motion forward, they are, they're, I mean, so to speak, they're like projectile motion parabolic path. Um, the earth curves away faster than the rate at which they fall. And so they always miss the ground. So as you can see in the examples over here, though, uh, there's quite a bit of gravity up where the space station and the ISS stays. And so there's a big misconception that, you know, there's no gravity in space. Oh, yeah, there's gravity in space. There's definitely gravity in space. Um, it doesn't matter how isolated you are. You're going to be attracted to something. It may be weak, but, it, you're, but if you're weightless, it's because you're not in equilibrium. Okay, you're not in equilibrium. That's really what it means. All right, find the acceleration due to gravity on the moon and Mars as a multiple of the Earth's gravity. Okay, well, this is pretty easy example. A little too easy, if I'm being honest, but I'm sure you're not going to complain about that. Um, so you're doing G, M over R squared for both the moon and Mars. Again, get on Wikipedia, get those numbers. Wiki I know a lot of teachers don't like Wikipedia. Well, they're wrong. Wikipedia is amazing. Wikipedia has actually been, at one point, I don't know when this was, this was years ago though, but um, there was some study done on Wikipedia and they found there were more errors in the Encyclopedia Britannica on a select group of articles. Um, and there were more errors in Encyclopedia Britannica than there was on uh, Wikipedia. I'll tell you how good Wikipedia is. Go ahead and try to change something in Wikipedia. Okay, Not, your changes are going to get reversed within seconds and you're likely to get an IP ban. Yeah. One time I killed the I killed the governor of California once on Wikipedia. That was way back, like in 2008. It took like an hour for them to fix it, but I got IP banned. So that's <laughs> it was like in the middle of class too. I just did it and uh, just to show how Wikipedia how good Wikipedia is. And uh, I was actually hoping that they would change it sooner, but it took like an hour. Like Gray Davis stayed dead for like uh, an hour. And uh, but now you try doing that now you can't do it anyway. Um, but my thing, uh, what my point is, is that it's it's curated by a lot of nerds, and uh, they know what they're talking about. So um, it's pretty reliable, honestly. When it comes to science and things like that, it, it's not the best resource in the world. Um, it can be a little dense, and I should just move on with my lecture here, actually. So right, anyway, uh, my point was that uh, you got to look up these numbers. Uh, there's a lot of numbers you got to look up in this chapter here. Mass of Mars, radius of Mars, things like that. And uh, you can see here, 3.8. 3.8, which is a third of the uh, a third of the gravitational acceleration Earth, which is very interesting because we're trying to send people to Mars, right? And uh, it's going to be hard because uh, a third of the gravity sounds a little fun, except when um, your body starts to... Uh, waste away due to atrophy. Uh, your muscles are going to start to waste away. Um, your bone structure is going to start to weaken. Yeah, I, I mean, among the other problems that there is on Mars, it's freezing cold. And by the way, if you haven't seen The Martian, pretty good movie. They don't really discuss the atrophy on Mars, though. They didn't really go into that much. I mean, you can fix it by just exercising, like, two hours every day. Uh, Anyway, 
Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm told you I was going to rant. I was going to go on forever. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, gravity is a conservative force. Right? That's something that we learned way back um, when we did energy stuff. And one of the consequences of, of a conservative force is that conservative forces have associated potential energies to them. Now, you saw a potential energy back when we did that stuff. It was MGY. And the gravitational energy increased as you got further away. Well, if you actually analyze the gravitational force uh, equation, okay, and you perform work. So what you do is you look at the statement for work, okay? If you look at the traditional statement for work, it's an integration, it's a line integral actually, right? You're trying to see how much force is applied along a particular path. And that tells you the work that's being done. Okay, well you could do this for the gravitational force. You take GMM over R squared, you can apply that to the work equation, you integrate that and you get this. This is what you get when you integrate uh, the force equation and that means the work that's being done, if it's an isolated system, is automatically equal to the, the, uh, the change in gravitational energy. Uh, or the change in any potential energy, in this case gravitational energy. And so this is a very different formula and it's actually a little puzzling because we started originally with mg why? And we had our gravitational energy was linear. Now this is different. This is not only is the R no longer in the numerator, it's in the denominator and it has a totally different behavior. It's not linear at all. It goes as one over R squared, which is a curve. Now it turns out that when you're at the surface of the earth, now did I, am I going to ruin my slide here? Let me jump ahead. I guess I don't talk about this anyway. Uh, you can do something called a um, binomial approximation, if you know what those are. Uh, you can approximate a 1 over r squared as a, as a series of uh, polynomials. And that's where you end up getting. If you approximate this equation at the surface of the Earth over a small range of values, then you, can, you end up getting, as part of the binomial approximation, you end up getting that you do have a linear dependence on small scales. On big scales, it's totally different. It's this equation here. Now it's inherently negative, okay? Inherently negative. And the zero point has been chosen for us here. We don't have the freedom to choose our zero points anymore. The zero point is at infinity. So the, the potential energy is zero at distances that are considered to be extremely far apart, effectively at infinity. As you move things closer together, the gravitational energy gets more negative, more negative. Okay, it, it, but that means it goes down. So it's a very strange concept here because we're talking about our energies as being purely negative. So imagine you have two objects that are separated at infinity, okay? And you let them, you let them go and you let them come at each other. Well, it'll take a long time, obviously. What happens is they start off with a potential energy of zero, okay? And uh, the potential energy starts to get more and more negative as energy is being converted from potential to kinetic. And so you'll see examples as we do this here, but it is, it is a very sort of strange looking formula. Okay. And this is, the, this is how the graph would look here. Uh, it's a one over X graph, it's negative. It's asymptotic with the uh, X axis. And uh, it's also asymptotic with the Y axis too. It approaches zero to infinity. And uh, the value of the potential energy gets increasingly smaller and smaller. Now it's smaller, but it's a larger negative value. And that means being smaller. And um, of course, then you never achieve that because you know, the minimum distance you can have two objects is, is simply the sum of their radii, right? Because you can't make the objects overlap unless you steal with quantum mechanics and then you can have things overlap. And well, that's for another, that's for another day. So, um, this graph here, so if you're watching this video later, you're watching it now, you're really going to want to take this slide, pause it, and just take it in, 
Okay, just stare at it for five minutes, 15 minutes. Take it in, because there's a lot going on in the slide here. Okay, look at the before picture up here. Right. You got your two masses separated by some distance. And that automatically establishes your total system energy, which is being indicated down here by this line. That line is the total system energy. It occurs at R1 where you start it. Okay, that establishes how much energy is in your system for the purposes of conservation. What happens is if you let the ball on the right go, it starts to move to the left. We have a energy transformation that is potential energy to kinetic. But what will happen is due to the nature of our potential energy equation, the potential energy will get more and more negative. It will get larger in magnitude, but because it's a negative value, it's being decreased. And when you look at the curve here, when you look at the curve here, the difference between the total energy and the potential energy, that distance there is what your kinetic energy is. So you can see as you move along to the left here, the curve starts to drop, and the difference between the two is what your kinetic energy is. And at some point, you can see the kinetic energy will grow very, very large until they hit. And the minimum distance that you have here is whatever the size of the objects are. So, But that's how it looks graphically. Graphically, that's how it looks. We'll do some numbers in a minute here, but I want you to get the you know, idea of the, of the picture first. Okay, which system has more gravitational potential energy? Now, what I'm talking about is when I say more, I'm talking about in magnitude. Don't worry about the negatives right now. Okay, think about that. Okay, the answer here is, well, hold on here, let's think about it. What do we got here? We got MM over R. Now on the other one here, we got 2m, 2m, so there's going to be a 4 on in the numerator, and the denominator is no longer r squared. Oh, that's different then. It's a. Because what you're going to have here is on the numerator, you're going to have a factor of 4 from the two masses, but in the denominator, you have a factor of 2. You're not squaring the potential energy uh, distance. So we end up with more potential energy here. Okay, So that's a big difference, and that's confusing for a lot of people. The force equation has an R squared, and the potential energy does not have an R squared. It has an R. But you'll put a squared there. Trust me. I've been doing this a long time. A lot of you do it. My advice to you is to not do it. All right, that's my advice to you. Don't do it. It's good advice, too. All right, let's get another example here. Okay. A 1,000-kilogram rocket, that's not very big, is fired straight away from the surface of the Earth. What speed does a rocket need to escape from the gravitational pull of the Earth. Oh, this is escape velocity. All right, so you're going to learn about escape velocity here. Oh man, I want to talk about black holes now. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm told you I was gonna, I was gonna calm down. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about black holes right now. All right, so our energy transformation is pretty simple here. Um, we start off with a pretty fast speed, and uh, what happens is as you throw the object up into the air, rocket, right? You're going to shoot a rocket up, right? Uh, now, this just to be clear about this, um, this rocket is not your normal rocket. You're, this rocket is, we're going to create like a giant pile of like, I don't know, gunpowder, and then we're just going to light it up and this is, this is going to get launched. Um, this is not thrust, okay? Not thrust. This is not normal rockets. Normal rockets don't do this. Normal rockets have thrust. They are propelled upward continuously. I'm talking about... I mean, I'm talking about, you know, walk outside right now and take a baseball and throw it into the air. That's what I'm talking about, okay? And if you do that, you know, what happens? It goes up to a certain height, stops, and falls back down, okay? Well, there is some speed where which you can throw it up, and um, it may slow down, but it won't come down, and it will escape the atmosphere of the Earth and fly away. And if that's the case, then you should pitch for the Dodgers because that would be... Nice if we could finally win a World Series. Anyway, um, so the energy transformation is kinetic to potential energy. And so we just put in the numbers that we know. One have mv squared. That's not different. G mm over r. That's the gravitational potential energy. Uh, solve for v. 
<clears throat> and you put your numbers in, you get 11.2 kilometers per second. So this is just a really simple energy transformation thing. Uh, now, I will say something here. Um, if you launch something up at 11.2 kilometers per second, um, <clears throat> it won't escape the atmosphere. All right? It won't escape it. Uh, why? Because <clears throat> of air resistance. This number <clears throat> doesn't take into account air resistance. Although you can come up with a new number, because guess what the energy transformation would be if you want to include air resistance? Kinetic to uh, gravitational potential plus E thermal. You'd have to incorporate energy loss due to drag, which is not a fun calculation, but uh, it exists and people do it. Uh, assume a non-rotating Earth. You may want to ask yourself, why does that matter? Uh, the reason why that matters is because whatever velocity you throw it up with, it already has a velocity, right? It has an inherent velocity to it because of the Earth spinning. So if you have a ro Earth that's rotating, you have to incorporate the kinetic energy it already has um, from rotating in addition to what you launch it up as. And it's not a big calculation to do, but you just be aware of that. Okay, again, this is why people say rocket science is hard. Because it is. It just is hard. You got a lot you got to take into account. And it's not easy to do. And there's been a lot of, I think, I think the statistics are, and I could be wrong about this, but I think a little under half of all missions that were intended for space have failed. I know that for Mars, a third of the missions we've sent to Mars have failed. Um, of course, you know of, there's been a couple tragedies uh, with space stations. And the Russians probably have a lot of stra uh, tragedies, but they don't want to admit anything. So, all right. <clears throat> oh, this is oh, this is what I was going to talk about earlier here. I'm not going to say much about this. I mean, you can definitely spend some time looking at the slide here. But this is that uh, approximation that I talked about before. Um, when you're near the surface of the Earth, you can do a binomial approximation and get some. It's a little math trick, but it allows you to uh, approximate. <clears throat> the term here, and it turns out that if um, <clears throat> the height that you are above uh, the Earth is very small, then a 1 over x relationship actually matches very closely to a linear relationship, and that's why you're able to get away with mgy. Now, as soon as you exit the Earth, that doesn't work anymore. Because then y is not small and the approximation doesn't hold anymore. So I'm not going to say much more about this and I'm not going to make you do anything about it. But I do recommend that you check out binomial approximations. Uh, they're pretty cool, if I'm being honest here. They're very neat. And uh, again, if you take me for future physics, um, well, I'm going to make you do a lot of these, actually. Because what happens is when you take relativity, uh, your numbers are so enormous or they're so small that you can't use your calculator. I'm, not, I'm literally not joking. You, your calculator cannot handle the numbers that we deal with in relativity. And so we have to learn how to use binomial approximations to figure out a way to put them in the calculator. That's fun. The first time I ever, somebody ever told me that when I was taking school, I was like, I don't think we're supposed to be learning this stuff. All right? If we can't use our calculator, it's probably for a good reason. Maybe we're delving into some dark arts or something. So that was that was a fun experience, but it's but yeah, you can't use your calculator for most of relativity. You have to figure out ways to approximate things. So I mean, just do this right now. Try to uh, take the square root of there. I mean, everybody has their calculators handy, obviously, right? Is this ten to the minus twelve? Yeah, well that works. Try another one. Oh, never mind. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Okay, sorry. All right, I'm having too much fun right now. I like this stuff quite a bit. Quite a bit. Okay, space station orbits the sun at the same distance as the Earth, but on opposite sides of the sun. Well, there's some, there's some good conspiracy theories there, by the way. People thinking that things are on the opposite side of the sun compared to the Earth. They think they're... Mysterious planets, Planet X, and all this crazy stuff. Again, I'm gonna. I'm trying to. Try not. To, I'm, I'm trying to focus here, people. Sorry. 
All right, so uh, what minimum speed does a probe need to escape the solar system? All right, so this is an escape velocity thing as well. It's the same problem as what we had before. It's an energy transformation of kinetic to potential energy. Why do I say skip? I don't know why I say skip here. We're not skipping. This is a good problem. Um, but here's what's different here. We're much farther away. Much farther away. Now, the best thing to do here is... Uh, you know, we know the how we move. The Earth uh, has a speed of about 30 kilometers per second or so. 30 kilometers per second. That's the natural speed it has as it goes around. So what we need to do is we need to be able to sort of provide an additional amount of speed. Okay, 30 is, is actually pretty close to allowing us to escape. Uh, when you get over a certain speed, um, you know, then you can escape... Uh, the solar system. So uh, now, again, energy transformation is the same. It's kinetic to potential. <laughs> the speed, though, is what I'm doing is I'm going to separate this out here. I'm going to say that the speed is the speed that you need, the additional amount of speed that you need, okay, um, plus what is already accomplished by simply being in orbit. Everything that is exactly one AU away from the sun travels at this speed. The Earth, a satellite, whatever you want to say, inherently travels at 30 kilometers per second. This is a requirement. If you want to be in an orbit that is exactly 1 AU or around 150 million kilometers from the sun, you would inherently have this. So I'm going to put it as V initial plus V boost because I already, I already want to incorporate the 30 that's in there. I set the kinetic energy equal to potential. I have my numbers. I put them in here. Um, now, the number at the bottom here is my 1 AU, 1.500 times 10 to the 11th. That's got to be in meters, right? And we get a, a speed of 42 kilometers per second. Now, we're already going 30. So you, all you got to do is you got to uh, bump it up to, uh, to uh, 12, uh, an additional 12 kilometers per second, and that will allow you to escape, okay? And obviously, the way you're going to escape is if you look at the picture here, there's a lot of directions you can go you're going to want to go in the direction that you're already moving because, again, you get, a, you get a huge boost from your own just orbital speed. So in this particular picture here, uh, if we were trying to leave our solar system, we're going to want to go directly down in terms of this picture here. Um, <clears throat> you've seen this equation already. I kind of did this in an earlier example here, but um, we are going to keep things simple. Uh, we know from Kepler's laws that when objects orbit, they orbit in uh, ellipses. But a circle is an ellipse. It's an acceptable um, shape to use, and it does make the mathematics a lot easier. So we're going to stick with circles. If you want to study ellipses, well, you should take junior level uh, mechanics. In fact, when you take junior level mechanics in physics, the very first thing you do is you start from Loon's Laws of Motion and you derive Kepler's Laws of Motion. It's the very first thing you do in that lecture. And um, it's kind of cool to see how the Laws of Motion and the Law of Gravity turns into Kepler's equations. So anyway, um, but uh, so for the case here, what we're doing is we're simply setting, um, you know, the force of gravity equal to m one uh, m v squared over r. It's a tripodal, uh, uh, it's going to act as a tripodal force. You solve for your V and you get the speed here. This speed tells you exactly how fast you need to be going to maintain a circular orbit. And the only variable here to really consider is R. Okay, say, say you're orbiting the Earth. Well, M is set in stone, right? It's, uh, it's the mass of the Earth, 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms or whatever it is. It's that. Uh, and then you got R. And what this shows is that uh, the speed will drop with a... Uh, inverse uh, square root of r. But this dictates, basically, um, how fast you need to go for different speeds. You can't go up in space and decide that you're going to orbit at whatever speed you want to orbit. Um, if gravity is the sole purpose for keeping you in orbit, you got to just follow what gravity tells you to do. And this is what gravity tells you to do. If you want to go faster or slower, you're going to need to have some kind of thrust in your rocket to do that. And you shouldn't do that because uh, just let the Earth help you out, right? So, two satellites have circular orbits with the same radius, which has a higher speed. This is a terrible question. Terrible question, right? You already know the answer to this. 
It's C. They have the same speed. Why? Because you're orbiting the same Earth and you're at the same distance. The fact that one has more mass doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> this is equivalent, by the way, of saying I'm going to drop a bowling ball and a feather, right, with no air resistance, what hits first? They hit the same time. This is the same question packaged a little differently, just so you know. Two identical satellites have different circular orbits, which has a higher speed. Ah, this is better, right? The one that's further away is slower. So the answer is B. Smaller orbit, higher speed. All right. Ah, uh, Kepler's third law. Did I really do that just now? Hold on, let me just check something here. I mean, it's cool and all, but... Yeah, I don't know if you really... Well, let me just check your homework. I'm going to make you do homework stuff here for that. I'm not. By the way, on the homework, number three... You're going to like number three. In fact, make sure you do number three and you do it right. And um, you really, because number three is what you do in like 120 for like the first like month. You just do that crap over and over and over again. So take in three. It's fun. A lot of vectors. A lot of vectors. By the way, vectors in 120, you think you liked vectors before? No. All right. So um, I really don't know why I'm talking about Kepler's third law, honestly. I'm just going to skip over it. Yeah. I mean, you kind of saw it. In the first example that I did, it was the first example. I basically did Kepler's third law. Um, but uh, seriously, I'll, I'm going to go on for like a half an hour if I, if I do that. Ah, uh, nope. Shoot. I'm skipping over this stuff. Sorry. I, mean, I know you want to hear it, but we'll be here forever. Forever. Okay, now, this is what I want to talk about here, actually. All right, so, we know what the speed of a satellite's going to be in orbit. So we know it's kinetic energy, okay? One half mv squared, but we're going to plug in for v, the v we got for the orbits, okay? Which is mg over r. So we plug that in, and we get this other expression here for... Um, for kinetic energy, which is fascinating because if you look at this equation here, it looks really similar to the gravitational potential energy. <clears throat> in fact, what you, you can see here is throw a negative sign in the front, take out the factor of two, and you basically have the gravitational potential energy. So we can make this really profound statement down here. Now remember, this is circular orbits. Okay, if you have elliptical orbits, you have to make some minor adjustments. Again, take some junior level physics and you'll learn how to do that there. It's not really a big deal, but you got to know some higher level math to do it. Um, so we have this beautiful relationship here that the kinetic energy is related to minus one half the gravitational energy. That's fascinating. That is amazing that that works that way because check out the equation down here. The total mechanical energy of an object that's in orbit is the sum, of course, of its kinetic and potential energies. But we know what the kinetic is. If I go ahead and substitute in this equation, what the kinetic energy is in terms of the potential energy, we find that the total mechanical energy is simply one half its gravitational potential energy. So in a way, if we're trying to do energy problems with things in orbit, we can effectively ignore the speed of the object. The only thing that ultimately determines the mechanical energy of the system or the overall energy of a something that's in orbit is basically just the value of R. That's it. Because R dictates V and uh, that takes care of kinetic. And so ultimately, both kinetic and potential are dependent on R. So that means the total mechanical energy is just R. And that is good because it makes the problems a lot simpler to do. That's it. A lot simpler to do. So we'll do an example and you'll see that. <clears throat> okay, this is, I said all this stuff before. All right, so this is a good example of this. So we have a, our rockets here, 
and we got our, 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 our rocket that's up at this uh, initial uh, orbit here, which is determined by the circle that's given by R1. And we'd like to send this up to a higher orbit, right? And so what that does is it requires you to kick this into a faster speed. If you have a faster speed, you're going to increase the size of your orbit here, actually. So by having thrust, you're going to be able to get outside of the circular orbit, and you're actually going to maintain a, an elliptical orbit for a time. And then you sort of kill the thruster here. Oops, sorry. And uh, and you do another kick that uh, that that takes you out of orbit one and then puts you into orbit two. So a second kick will take you out of the elliptical orbit and put you into a circular orbit. And this is effectively how orbital levels work for rockets and things like that. If you're trying to move things up to higher orbits, what you do is you provide a little bit of thrust to increase the kinetic energy because that means you're increasing the potential energy, which you need to do in order to do this. And you basically require to kick the rockets on two different times. Uh, such that that you maintain the same system energy. So you kick once up here and you kick once down here, and then you will maintain this this one half UG uh, value for the system energy that you need to uh, to propel yourself. Right? So let's do an example of that. I think this is my last thing I'm going to cover. Okay, I guess it wasn't that bad. I didn't go on for too long. I could have. All right. So great problem. Space shuttle um, is in a 250 kilometer high circular orbit. We want it to head up to a higher orbit that's 610 kilometers up uh, to uh, get in contact with the Hubble Space Station. This is what happened actually in 1990. We launched the, we launched Hubble up and then we found out after we launched it, somebody screwed up the calculations on the mirrors and they didn't work at all. Like they opened up the, the telescope and then everything was blurry. And then they went through and looked at it and they're like, doh, we messed up the mirrors. And so they couldn't use Hubble for like six months. They had to shoot up a space shuttle, a special space shuttle, just to fix the Hubble, the Hubble telescope. But what they had to do, they had to go up to the normal orbits and then they had to kick themselves up higher to reach where Hubble was and they had to get out and fix it and then come back down. So that wasn't... That wasn't great. That was kind of embarrassing. But anyway, Hubble turned out to be amazing, as you've probably seen all the pictures. So we want to know how much energy is required to boost it to the next orbit. So what that means is you're going to have to characterize what the energy is going to be at 250 and at 610. And you'll need to subtract them. Okay? Because obviously when you're up at 610, you're going to have more gravitational energy. So you need to figure out how much you'd actually need to impart in terms of your thrust, how much energy are you going to have to do? Because your thrust is basically work, right? You're doing work on your spacecraft to increase its energy so that it can get up to the higher orbit here. And so uh, we're taking a difference between final and initial. Uh, the final is when we're up at 610. The initial, obviously, is when we're down at, at, at 250. And so um, you just need to work out these numbers here. So you can factor out the Gs and the Ms and everything. Take that stuff out. Um, and we find that the difference here is around 1.2 times 10 to the 11 joules, which is an enormous amount of joules. Um, by the way, just take note right here. I, I highlighted this a couple times in this problem here. But when you put the R's in here, you need to include the radius of the Earth. You can't use the numbers that are here. You'll still do it. Trust me. No offense. But, um, but you should not do it. Make sure you put in the... Because uh, what you'll do is if you do this, you'll find that the energy doesn't make any sense. It's going to be like way too big. I mean, this is already huge, right? This is huge, but we're talking about orbiting the Earth, and that's uh, that's not easy to do. Anyway, so what is this? This is uh, 120 billion joules, right? 120 billion joules. Okay, I think that takes me to the end of this. It does, so let me stop my video, actually. I'll put this up.